So today is our first day that we can talk about some exciting organic chemistry. Yeah. All right, so just a couple of announcements. Remember I mentioned this on Monday that labs start next week. Okay, so don't go this week. Um, remember that the things that you should be doing now is getting registered for Connect and doing the pretest and the synthesis review problems. Each of those are, are for extra credit. Okay? Don't worry about your score on the pretest. Uh, clearly, you ha if you haven't taken this class before and you're asked questions on the class, you're not going to know it very well, right? So remember what I'll do. You just do your best. If you get one point or two points, that's fine. After everybody's done, I will change everybody's score to five points for doing that. Okay? Yeah, question? So the pretest says it's unpublished and I can't access it. I don't know if that's just given anyone else. Has anybody else had... It's in connect. Okay. Yeah, sometimes there are like some old assignments that are hidden in there that I don't always get erased or something. So all of our assignments will be in connect. Okay? But if you run into those things, just send me an email and I'll try to figure them out, right? I know at the beginning here I'm still kind of sorting things out with this whole new system and I, hopefully I get it set up right. All right, um, so you want to do both of those. Remember that you should also, if you want to participate in the extra credit clicker questions, then make sure to follow the directions that are on the syllabus, lead you to a place that tells you how to do it all, and get your clicker or your, the app for your phone, and get all that registered and, and squared away. Remember that if you're going to actually use a clicker, you don't have to pay any money. Okay, you have to set up this Reef account and you have to register your clicker in that account, but you don't have to pay anything else. All right, so if, it, if you click on something that says, oh, you have to pay, then don't do that. Okay? All right, the other bit of information is we have our SI, Jake. Is right up here in front. He's going to stand up and wave at all of you right now. Jake uh, took the, um, the 2310 class from me last year before I went on sabbatical. All right, so he's going to be starting. These will start next week. Um, the times are Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, 7.30 to 8.20 p.m., in those locations, all right? So that'll start next next week, okay? All right, so any questions on the syllabus? Remember, you should read the syllabus. Make sure you know that what's in there, okay? All right, so um, last time all we really did is go over the course, the syllabus, a little bit of information, a little preview of, of the topics we're going to cover, maybe a little bit of information of of how, what kind of problems you might see, um, and all that kind of thing. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to, okay, let's stop talking. Even if it's just a little bit of talking, that slight roar interrupts other people in the class. They can't hear if you do that. Um, we're going to go over just a little bit of a, uh, an overview of the different organic structure determination techniques that we're going to cover in these first two chapters, and then we're going to start into chapter 13, which starts with mass spectrometry. So that's going to be our first technique that we're going to learn about. All right, oh, the other thing, yeah, the eye clicker. So if you want to do our first eye clicker uh, question, it's going to be on Friday, okay? All right, so like we finished off, we finished off on this last time, and we pointed out the first thing that um, out of these four techniques, one of them is the oddball is different, and that's the one we're going to talk about first, and that's mass spectrometry. All right, all of the other methods are called spectroscopy, and spectroscopy are techniques that involve the absorption of light, the absorption of electromagnetic radiation by a molecule. All right. Mass spectrometry, as we'll see, uses an electron beam, so it doesn't use light. 
So that's a little bit different. For the techniques that use light, the difference between them all is the energy of the light that's used. All right? And that energy will cause something to take place in the molecule. And whatever takes place, the process that takes place has an energy difference, and the energy of the light has to match the energy difference of that process that's taking place in the molecule. So each kind of light is going to probe a different aspect, a different property of the molecule. When we look at infrared spectroscopy here, it turns out that the light or the frequency of that light, well, I'll remind you about the relationships between energy and frequency and those things in a, a minute, but the frequency of that light is the same frequency as which bonds vibrate and bend, okay? So when the light comes in, if the frequency of light matches the frequency of the bond stretching, then it will absorb light, okay? So different kinds of bonds vibrate or bend at different frequencies, and so they will absorb different frequencies of light. So each kind of bond will absorb a different frequency of light. And in organic chemistry, essentially the way we can think about this is different bond types essentially correlate to different functional groups. So IR is good at identifying the presence of different functional groups in the molecule. All right? UV visible, we're not going to talk about this one, but I just wanted to mention it here. UV visible light is much higher energy, and that has the right amount of energy to elevate an electron from one orbital to a higher orbital. So it actually pops electrons up. Though it can only do that when we have conjugated pi systems, meaning that we have double bonds that are next to each other, okay? So that brings the orbitals closer in energy. If we have only an isolated alkene, the energy gap is too big, and even that ultraviolet light doesn't have enough energy to elevate the electron. So essentially what ultraviolet visible spectroscopy does is it's able to detect detect these kind of conjugated pi systems. Mm -hmm. right? It really doesn't give a lot of structural information other than that, and so I think that's why they've kind of taken it out of the chapter. What it is good sometimes for is it's very sensitive, and it's used as an analytical method for detecting molecules or separate, separating molecules. Sometimes we'll follow the separation based upon ultraviolet absorption. Or it can be used for quantitating the amount of a compound that's present. All right? But we're not going to really go into that e any more than that. The big technique here that we'll spend a whole chapter on is this one that sounds very complicated, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Okay? And so we usually refer to this as, as NMR, so we don't have to say that whole thing every time. NMR, what it can do is it can directly detect the presence of hydrogens and carbons, okay, in separate experiments. So it provides information about the number of hydrogens or carbons and how many adjacent, usually, hydrogens there are. So if we have a hydrogen on a carbon, we can tell how many hydrogens are on adjacent carbons and it tells us information about their environment. So what atoms, other atoms, are nearby? Is there oxygen next to it? Is it on a benzene ring? Is it on a double bond? Is it, you know, we can get all of this kind of information. The name doesn't give us the full story, though. It says nuclear magnetic, but that doesn't tell us what type of electromagnetic radiation is used. All right, and so... In NMR, we're actually using radio waves. I'll, I'll cover this again in just a minute. So these are the methods. So each spectroscopic method uses a different energy of light, and that different energy of light causes something different to take place in the molecule. So this uh, figure is just kind of a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
Okay, and there's a lot of different things on here, and it's probably too small to read, but the things that we'll focus on here, let me just focus on, well, I'll do it here, is there's a scale up here, which is the wavelength, and I'll explain these in just a minute. There is another uh, scale down here for frequency, and a scale down here for energy. Okay, so let's look at the relationship between these three values. All right, so electromagnetic radiation can be considered as a wave. And that wave has several properties. One, the distance between the tops of the waves, this distance here is called the wavelength. And if we start at one point and we go to some other point, the frequency is how many oscillations take place within a time period, usually per second. Right? So a higher frequency will have a much faster wave, and a low frequency will have a very long, very slow wave. Okay, so this is frequency here. Now the important relationships are that the energy of this light, first it equals, we say E equals H nu. So this H is just a constant. It's called Planck's constant. And all we need to know is that it's a constant. That doesn't change. We're not going to calculate these things or anything. And this new value here, this is the frequency. Okay? The main thing that we want to know from this part is that the energy is directly proportional to the frequency. All right, so what would happen if we go to a higher frequency? Is that a higher energy or lower energy? Higher energy. Higher frequency, higher energy. All right, if we continue on across here, we see also Planck's constant again. C is the speed of light. And this lambda right here is the wavelength. And so what we want to take home from this is because the lambda is in the denominator, the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. right? And the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So as we go higher in energy, the frequency goes higher, but the wavelength gets shorter. And that makes sense, right? If we have a wave like this, if it's going very fast, then the distance between those, the wavelength, gets very small. If we have a very slow frequency, then the distance from peak to peak is wide, and so there's a long wavelength, okay? All right, so for infrared spectroscopy, all right, it's basically this part here in the middle, and I kind of, it's right here in the red, okay? So infrared is kind of in the middle of the range. Infrared is really just heat radiation. In fact, it's what's the type of radiation that's used for these night cameras or night goggles, things like that. You can just see the heat coming off of living organisms. As I said before, the frequency, the energy of, of IR light is the same as bond vibrations or bond bending and stretching and motions like that. Because different bonds have different frequencies, we can focus on identifying different functional groups um, in IR. Okay, so here, let me just point out here, I could have done this before. So the energy is at the bottom, so the energy is increasing going from left to right. The wavelength at the top, which is going to be, the wavelength is going to be getting longer. Am I doing this right? No, I got this backwards, sorry. Energy is increasing as we go from left to right, okay? Wavelength is getting shorter going from left to right, and frequency is getting faster going from left to right, just 
the relationships we talked about. All right, so that's infrared here. If we dial it visible, then we're moving in this direction. So here's the ultraviolet visible right here. The very small colored part in the middle, that's the entire visible range. Okay, that's what we can see. Okay, see how small it is relative to the whole scale here. So this is higher in energy. It's moved to higher in energy. Like I said, it causes a electron uh, transitions and is good at detecting conjugated pi systems. Okay? The last NMR, look, it's way down here, right? So we've gone way down to a lower energy, bigger wavelength, lower frequency, and these radio waves um, are the right amount of energy to interact with nuclear spins, okay? It turns out that spins are kind of all random and not split into different energy levels until we put them into a magnetic field. So we put the sample in the magnetic field, it splits the spins into more than one energy level, and then radio waves are the electromagnetic radiation which can elevate a nuclear spin from one level to the other, okay? But these gaps, these energy gaps are very small, it's very low energy, okay? So like I said, so here, magnetic is used to split the spins, good for detecting hydrogens and carbons. You can also do phosphorus and fluorine and a bunch of the different metals, but we're going to focus on hydrogen and carbon. All right, tells us the number of atoms and something about the atomic environment. Okay, so these are the techniques we're going to learn about. All right, so chapter 13, the first technique, well, this is going to be on mass spectrometry and, oh, I think you can see that stuff up there when I do this. Hmm. Okay, and infrared spectroscopy. Okay, we're going to start with mass spectrometry. So we're going to We've already kind of done this. We're going to talk about how this method works and what we measure. And then we're going to learn how to apply the information to structure determination. All right, in mass spectrometry, we can gain several types of information. Like the name implies, we can measure a mass. All right? And we can measure the mass. What we measure is actually not just purely the mass, but we measure the mass to charge ratio. So we're going to have to make ions, and then we're going to measure a mass to charge ratio of those ions. For the technique we're going to look at, the charge is always one. So essentially we're measuring the mass. But there are mass spectrometric techniques where you can have multiply charged ions. These are usually for big proteins and things like this. They can make lots of ions and then it makes it behave like it's a smaller ion because the mass to charge is lower. All right, so we're going to measure the mass to charge ratio from this. If we have from this, we hope to be able to gain some information about the molecular formula. Okay, this is important information if we're trying to determine a structure. And what we can also gain from this technique is some information about the connectivity of atoms because the ion that's generated initially will often fragment or break into pieces. And it follows some reproducible mechanisms in order to do that. Right? So we see the masses of these fragments, and we can kind of work backwards to, to help us uh, determine the structure. Okay? So there's several stages in this technique as well. So the first stage is that we need to generate an ion. Okay? And um, the way that we're going to talk about doing this is that we usually have some molecule, I'm just going to call this M, this for our molecule or analyte or something, and we're going to take electrons and we're going to shoot that molecule with electrons. 
Okay, we've got like an electron gun. And that's going to energize the molecule, and once it's energized, it's going to eject an electron. Okay, so this goes like this, and we're gonna, I'm just going to draw it like this. We kind of lose the electron that, well, let's say we're, that one that's shooting in, we're, it's just to energize it, but then we're ejecting an electron. And so what we end up is with an ion, we've lost an electron, so what would be the charge of the ion? A plus charge. We usually draw it like this, a plus, and then there's an extra electron. So if we had a pair of electrons in a bond somewhere, non-bonding, we knocked out one, we got one left over. Okay, so this species here is a radical cation. Okay, it has both a radical there and a cation. Okay, once we've generated this, this charge species, then we need to separate, and well, what this will do also is oftentimes, like I said, is fragment, split into pieces. If we're lucky, there's some of the ion left over that has all of the atoms in it. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And then what we need to do is separate, well, I have this down at the bottom here. We then need to separate the ions and detect them. Okay, so let me show you a little diagram of what the instrument um, looks like. So if you're just trying to do all of these notes freehand, remember that, you know, I have essentially the notes that I'm showing you here and that I'm writing on, they're all posted on, well, at least for a couple of chapters so far, are all posted on Canvas. So I would recommend to download those, and I see a lot of you doing that already, and make your notes on there because you draw things like this, right, fast enough, unless you're like just the super artist. Okay, so this is just a kind of a diagram of, of the mass spectrometer. So over here is where the sample is introduced to the mass spectrometer, all right? And what we have to do here is we need to <coughs> vaporize the sample. So we need it into a gaseous phase. Right? And usually in this technique, there's two ways that help to do this. Is one, we can heat the sample. And two, we have this sample under a vacuum. All right, so if we reduce the pressure, then the sample will boil at a much lower temperature, right? Just like when you go up in altitude, right? The boiling point goes down. So once we vaporize it, it kind of finds its way over, over here and goes through this little slot. And this filament right here, these little red lines, are the electron beam, okay? So these vaporized molecules just kind of float along and then some of them get shot and get hit by electrons. When they do that, they get excited, they eject an electron, they make a cation, and then you might imagine this repeller plate here. So if this has a negative, no, it has a positive charge on it, when that cation is generated, the two pluses are going to repel each other, and the ion is going to be shot down a tube. Okay. The other way is that the other side, these negatively charged focusing plates, they can kind of be turned on and off. So if there's a negative charge there, the cation will be pulled towards it, but then it's turned off and then it just flies past. Okay. So the ions are going to shoot down this tube. All right. And then the ion separation part is when they go between these two magnets, all right? And as charged particle will be deflected as it goes through a magnetic field, all right? The amount that it's deflected or turned, and I'm just going to show you this, but we're not going to calculate or anything. I don't know if this one's in the book. The radius, so if this is a circle right here, 
right? The radius of this turn, how much it curves, equals the square root of the mass to charge ratio times 2 times V over B squared. So the mass to M over Z, this is what we usually use for mass to charge. V is the voltage for the acceleration. Okay, so those are those accelerating plates. The stronger the voltage they are, the faster they'll go. All right, and B is the magnetic field strength, which is causing the ions to, to turn. Okay, so what we can see here is that the mass to charge ratio is, is proportional to the radius. All right, so a higher mass to charge ratio will have a bigger radius, and if it, for a given situation, it might just go off to the side, makes it too big of a curve, and doesn't even hit the detector, right? A small uh, mass to charge might turn too sharp. And so what we essentially have to do is we have to scan through, use that magnetic field and scan through. We kind of bend the whole beam around like this. And in that process, we can measure all the different masses. Okay, at any one magnetic field, only a certain mass to charge ratio will hit the detector. Okay, so we scan through. So here we can scan the magnetic field. All right, so then it goes through a little slit here at the end, gets collected, and then there's a detector, and then it gives us a graph, all right? And it's that graph that we're going to want to be able to detect or de interpret. Questioning the magnetic field or changing the B variable. Right, exactly, right. So you could do it in two ways. You can either change the B or you could change the V, right, the accelerator voltage. Right, so either of those could be changed and, and change which of the ions are going to hit the detector at any certain combination of variables. All right, so this is what the spectrum looks like. Okay, so this is just of, of, of methane. So this is about as simple as we can get. But the main thing to see is that we have this graph on the x-axis is the mass to charge ratio. All right. So as we see, we're getting larger mass as we go from left to right. What's the mass of methane? 16, right? Carbon is 12. Each of those hydrogens is 1. And so that's at right here at 16. Okay? So we have the mass to charge ratio on the y-axis we have the relative abundance. So the height of the peak is telling us how many of those ions are being detected. Okay. The bigger the peak, the more abundant the ions are. The more, either the more stable they are, the more readily they're formed, those kind of things. All right? The ion that has all of the atoms of the molecule is referred to as the molecular ion. Okay, so this has, includes all atoms. Okay, another thing in this one is here is that the most abundant ion is called the base peak. Okay, in this case, the molecular ion is also the base peak, but they don't have to be the same. Okay? The base peak, the intensities are always adjusted, so the base peak is at 100%. Okay? The other things we can see then is notice that there's this very, there's an arrow here, they're showing this very small ion right to the upper end of the molecular ion. 
call this the M. M is the is the molecular ion plus one, so it's one mass unit higher. All right, so how can you have a higher mass if you already have a molecular ion that has all of the atoms of the molecule? Right, so the reason is, is that this, this M plus one contains, it's usually the isotope for carbon, so it has a C13 isotope. And for carbon, C12 is, you know, is vastly the major isotope, but C13 is 1.1% of all the carbon. Okay? So this is going to be 1.1% for each carbon. Okay, methane has only one carbon, so this peak would be exactly, or very close, with an experiment, 1.1% of the, of the peak that it's the isotopes of. Yeah. So if it had two carbons, it would be twice. Right, right. if there were two carbons, this peak should be 2.2% of that ion. If there's six carbons, it should be 6.6%. Because there's 1.1% chance that each of the carbons in the molecule, right, the same chance for each one, okay? So the one main thing we have to do, well, I'll show you that in a minute, okay, is that we have to make sure that the peak that we're looking at, if we have a, 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 a list of abundances, we have to make sure that the peak that we're looking at is at 100% if we want to me measure that percentage, all right, so the other thing here, we have this M plus 1, is all of these peaks just below the molecular ion are generated by fragments. So the molecule's falling apart. There's not too many things that methane can do, right? But let's say we make an ion like this. Here's our radical cation. We're not really even saying, really, for methane, the only place we can ionize are within those carbon-hydrogen bonds, right? There's no other X electrons. So essentially, you have a carbon-hydrogen bond, and we've knocked one of the electrons out, and so that bond becomes weakened because there's only one electron in it, right? So that bond can break. We end up with a cation plus a radical. Right, so we're here, we're going to lose a hydrogen radical, and we then get CH3+. Plus. Okay, we don't see the radical, there's no charge on it. We just see the loss of that. And so that would give us our, our you know, the second biggest ion here is at is it, uh, 15. Okay? And then we could go on down, we could lose another radical, another radical, and we get a smaller and smaller ion. But notice the next ones are much lower abundance. Okay? Yeah, question. Is the N plus 1 peak based off of the molecular ion or the most abundant ion? Uh, okay, so the question is, is that N plus 1 peak, is it based upon the most abundant one or the, the molecular ion? Essentially... Every ion in the spectrum, every time we have a fragment that has some composition of atoms, if it has carbons in it, it's always going to have an M plus 1 ion. Because every ion in the, in the spectrum, if it has carbon in it, it has 1.1% chance that those carbons are C13 isotope rather than C12. Okay? So what we would usually look at, though, so actually this M minus 1 fragment would also have an M plus 1 peak, and that's kind of superimposed in here. Okay? All right, so what does it look like if we have something than just methane? All right, so let's go to a, to a, a slightly bigger molecule. So this is also still just a... Um, linear alkane, okay? And on the right, I've put here, this is where I got it. You can look this up, spectral database for organic compounds. You can type in any name or formula and it gets you all these data and stuff. Um, starts with the higher mass on the bottom. So 
86 right here is the molecular ion. It has an abundance in this spectrum of 22.4%. Right? So this one here is at 86. This is the M is the molecular ion. Okay? If we go down here, this one at I think it's 57, this equals the base peak the biggest peak, set at 100%. We can look up here and we see, oh, 57, sorry. Oh, that's what I wrote. 57, 100% right here, okay? Notice the one at 57 has an M plus one. The one at 86 has an M plus one, okay? Because they all have some amount of C13 in them. In fact, if we take these two right here, so that's the M and M plus 1, if we scale this up to give 86, to we set this at 100%, then the, the 87 ends up being 6 point, oops, 6.7. Okay, so all I did, right, is I just divided 1.5 by 22.1. I got the ratio and then multiplied it by 100. So that made this one 100, made this one 6.7. Okay, so we know that for every carbon in the molecule, it, it adds 1.1%. So how many carbons do you think is in this fragment, in this, not fragment, in this ion? Six, right? That's what comes the closest. So this number here would tell us that there's six carbons in this ion, okay? Now the other things that are important here is to look at the masses of the fragments. So that's the molecular ion. All of these other ones are all fragment ions. Yeah. How did we select the molecular ion as? As the molecular ion. How did we designate it? As yeah, the so that, that can sometimes be tricky. For one thing, it has to be the highest mass, okay. kind of cluster at least. It's going to have an M plus one, but it has to be the highest mass, right? And if you know how to do all this, it has to be able to somehow lead to the other ions by fragmentation. But the problem is with this is this is a very high energy process and we're not going to be able to explain how every one of these other peaks are formed. Okay? We're going to try to pick out hopefully the biggest one and usually what gives us more information are the ions that are at the higher mass range. You know, if we have an ion clear down here, or way down here, if we had an ion at 15, the only way we can come up with 15 is a CH3 group, right? But almost, air, you know, like millions of organic molecules have CH3 groups. That doesn't tell us very much, right? Alternatively, if we look from the difference in mass from here, Starting at 86 to 71, what's the difference in mass there? Yeah, that's, so that's minus. We're losing 15. So that tells us that the molecule is in such that it is going to break off a methyl group. Okay, not every molecule will do that. If we had a cyclohexane ring, there's no methyl groups, and so it won't split that off. Yeah? I don't understand exactly what the base is. The base peak is simply the tallest peak in the, in the spectrum. Okay. And in this case, it's just the most abundant fragment? Well, yeah, so the base peak is always the most abundant ion. It can be, like the methane spectrum, it can be the molecular ion, we're not or it can be some fragment ion. We're not necessarily interested in the identity of the fragment in this case. We care about the molecular ion. Well... So the question is why, you know, do we, you know, care about this? So I think we, you know, we want most of all to know about molecular ion. 
But there's some reason that this peak is, this ion is the most abundant. Right? So that means that that fragment, that ion, must be stable or easily formed. And so we would like to be able to identify what the base peak is as well. Yeah. Question in the back. So for the M plus one value, which is 6.7, do we only care about like the whole number and we would never round it? Yeah, I think. So they don't really go through this too much in our book. Um, you know, there are other isotopes of other atoms that can also contribute to the size of this. So, and there is some experimental error in the measurement here. And so we're going to, yeah, kind of have to round it one way or another to see what fits. Sometimes it's going to be further off. Sometimes it can be closer. Um, it doesn't always end up as perfect as we like it to be. Yeah? Will a molecular peak always be present, or is it possible that it is only like a fragment? Right. So that's a good challenge, too, in identifying the molecular ion. Because sometimes, if the, if the molecular ion very readily, very easily, well, if it's not very stable and it very readily fragments, you can have a spectrum that doesn't show the molecular ion. Okay? And then, you know, so maybe we don't see this, and we only see that we're starting here. Then it's a more challenging aspect because you don't know whether it's a molecular ion or not. Okay? We'll talk about one way in a little bit that we might be able to tell if we saw this, we might be able to tell that that's not the molecular ion. Okay? But I'll save that, and we'll get to it in a minute. Yeah? Where did the 6.7 come from? Oh, all I did is I took the ratio here and I just scaled it up. Yeah, question. Where do you get these fragment ions from? Is it just from us using mass spectrometer and they get produced? Or? So the fragment ions, essentially what we're doing, so imagine this. Um, oh, I can't write on my paper. that You won't see that. <laughs> so let's say, so C6, let's just figure this out. C6, six times... 12, right, is 72 plus something to give 86, right? So this is just C6, H14, right? So it's just a spectrum of hexane. So let's think about if we had some hexane, I'm going to draw this carbon here. Let's just imagine that in this bond right here, this is the electron that got knocked out, okay? This bond is now very much weakened. And so that bond is going to fragment, and what it's going to give usually is a cation on one side, and we're going to go into this later, and a radical on the other side, okay? We weaken the bond, it just breaks in half, we get two pieces, usually one's a cation, one's a radical. The radical just goes away, we can't see it, right? Because it doesn't get accelerated down the tube. The cation we can see, and this is a fragment ion. Okay, if this one is with three, then that probably turns out to be, you know, the one at 43. Okay? Um, but, yeah, we'll see a lot of examples here, so I don't want to get too bogged down right now. Let's look at some more. Since it's minus 15, what we usually want to look at is not necessarily from here to here to here to here. The fragments aren't usually sequential like that. They can, but that's not the main way that we look at it. We usually look at it from the molecular ion down to the fragment ions. Okay? So, from 86 to 57... is minus 29, right? So minus 15 is minus a methyl group, right? So that means that this hexane is cleaved between, you know, right next to the methyl group. What would be the loss of, a, of 29? An ethyl group, right? So this is minus CH2, CH3. Then we might go from 86, oops, to this one here. This is going to be minus 43. What's that going to be? Minus a propyl group, okay? 
So minus CH2. So this is very characteristic of linear alkanes in that we have a loss of 15 first and then notice that these other ones are all 14 mass units apart, right? Because we essentially have a string of CH2 groups, which are 14 mass units. Okay, so this kind of pattern, we can identify, you know, alkanes like this. Okay? Question? Yeah. So between each peak, is it always, like, from the highest, the molecular ion to the next fragment, is it always going to be a methyl? Okay, so the question is, is from the molecular ion to the next peak always going to be a methyl? No. It just happens that for hexane, that's one fragment that we get. Okay. Doesn't mean that that's the first fragment that takes place. It's uh, for ion that's this abundant relative to this one that's way more abundant. Okay. Okay. So let's look in this last bit. I'm not, of course, making it quite as far as I hoped. I like all the questions because it means you're a little bit interested, but um, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll start to pique your interest. All right, so once we ha know we have a molecular ion, then from that molecular ion, it would be nice to be able to generate a molecular formula. Right? That's what we really need. Okay? So the book kind of goes through a reason, kind of a weird, I've never seen this approach exactly before. It's kind of a, sequ uh, a sequential thing here. But so this is what we're going to do. For this, and here's some of the directions over here. So if we only have a molecule with carbon and hydrogen, then what we're going to do is we're going to take this mass, 114, we're going to divide it by 12. 12 is the mass of carbon. We're just going to calculate what is possibly the very maximum number of carbons that we could have in this molecule. Okay? So for this, if we do this, it gives us 9.5. Okay, so this would give us a formula of C9, and the 0.5 part, whatever's left over, is, has to be made up in hydrogens. Okay, so 0.5 times 12, this would be C9H6. All right? So C9H6, that's not very many hydrogens for nine carbons. Right? What's the maximum number of hydrogens we can get for nine carbons? Twenty, right? Because an alkane, a saturated alkane, C is two N plus two hydrogens. Right? So what we can do to get a better one here is we can cross out, we're gonna subtract a carbon, and we're gonna convert those twelve mass units to twelve hydrogens. Okay, we're just going to trade them in. So that would give us C8H18. Okay, would that one work? Yeah, yeah so that works pretty good. So it, it does turn out that this first one that I picked, well, <clears throat> it could be that. Okay, there's other options. Let's do one more really quick here. This one's at 88. So we're going to divide by 12. That gives us 7.33. Okay, so our starting point is C7H. We take one-third of 12, so H4. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, we have very few hydrogens for the number of carbons. Let's do the same thing we did before. We're going to subtract the carbon, add 12 hydrogens. C6H16. All right, what about that formula? How does that look? No, it's not that good, right? We actually have too many hydrogens. So maybe this one has an oxygen in it as well. <coughs> so the way that we do this is we are going to subtract a CH4 group and we're going to replace it with an oxygen. Okay, we do CH4 because 12 plus 4 is 16. That's the same mass as oxygen. So this would get us to a C5... H12O. 
All right, so that's starting to look pretty, it could be pretty good. But in fact, we could do this one more time. Sorry, let's do it one more time, minus CH4, and then we'll be done, plus an oxygen, C4H8O2. Okay, so that's possible too, right? So all we're going to generate here is a number of possibilities, and we're probably going to have to look at some other data to be able to choose which one is the right one. All right? So I will see you guys tomorrow. Remember, 3 o'clock in Echo Science, Spartan Center, 1.30. Okay.